Welcome to the Daily Objective brought to you by the Ayn Rand Center UK, where we talk about current events and all things that matter from an objectivist perspective. We're departing a little bit from straight objectivism today because there's been some uh, pretty intense current events in the United States of late. On March 27th, uh, a trans individual by the name of Aubrey, Audrey Hale uh, committed a mass shooting at a place called the Covenant School in Nashville, Tennessee. And then Monday in Knoxville, in Knoxville, there was a, uh, a bank shooting where a mass shooter went into a bank and uh, killed multiple people before either being taken down or committing suicide himself. I'm not sure what I'm, that exactly happened in that scenario. I'm sure uh, my, my great guest here, John Lott, can clear up some of the details. For all of you who do not know John Lott, uh, he is an author who has written some great books, all of which I have read, I am proud to say, uh, Gun Control Myths, uh, More Guns, Less Crime, and The War on Guns. I think he is the premier expert on gun crime in America, if not perhaps the world, and I'm proud to call him a friend of mine. Uh, John Lott, how are you doing, sir? Oh, great. Great to talk to you, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So, of, of course, uh, these last two shootings, especially given the fact that they were in such close proximity to each other, started the usual round of political agita, agita on social media, agita uh, through the media itself for gun control. You know, let's deal with the first crime, the one that happened on the 27th um, with, with Audrey Hale. Is there any gun control law that could have stopped this individual from doing what they do? Because they, they claim that this person had seven guns, three of which, uh, seven of which they bought legally, three of which they used in, to commit the crime. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, so some of the laws that they've been pushing have been things like background checks on the private transfers of guns. Uh, it wouldn't have stopped this attack. I, I kind of wish the media once in a while would go and ask these guys when they put out these different proposals, well, would it have stopped the one we're talking about? Would it have stopped any recent ones? Uh, because there's not one mass public shooting this century that would have been stopped. Biden then also talked about an assault weapons ban. Uh, it's true that one of the guns there was an AR pistol that uh, uh, the person had there. And, uh, but the gun that was actually used to go and shoot people appears to have been a handgun, uh, and which isn't by any stretch of the imagination been included in assault weapons in the past. And so, you know, it, it's hard to see how it would have had any impact there. Um, to me, one thing that just drives me nuts about the media coverage and about the general discussion is that both of these occurred in places where people weren't allowed to have guns. Uh, uh, in, in Tennessee, if you take a, a handgun or a, a rifle into a school gun-free zone, it's punishable by six years in prison. You know, if you or I were to go and violate that type of rule, six years in prison would completely change our lives. I mean, our lives would be completely destroyed at that point. That's a real penalty for us. But if you're going to go and kill six people like this murderer did, and assuming that they had lived rather than being shot by the police and killed, they'd be facing six life sentences or six death penalties. Do you really think that somebody who's facing six life sentences, that the fact that they may face an additional six years on top of those six life sentences, they say, well, I can, I can put up with the six life sentences, but if you make an additional six years on top of it, that would just be too much for me to have to go and deal with. So what you end up having with these types of laws is that the law abiding good citizens who would make a real penalty for uh, obey these rules. And these murders take advantage of the fact that they'd be the only person around there that's going to have a gun. But, you know, even more so, what drives me nuts is this the media coverage on this. So one of the things the, the Biden administration, in a very unusual move, uh, quickly took uh, possession of the manifesto uh, that this murderer had. Mm -hmm. And they've yet to release it. Uh, in all the other cases that I know that a diary or manifesto has been available, it's been released immediately or within a day or something like that. And now we're talking about weeks afterwards. But one thing that has come out from the manifesto uh, was the Nashville police chief said that this person had another place that they had targeted, apparently not a school, but some other type of place. And it had been their first choice. 
But when this murderer had checked it out, uh, they believed that there was too much armed security so that they decided not to go after that, instead pick the school to go after. And it just, it just seems to me, I see this time after time where these murders explain why they picked the target that they did and why isn't that newsworthy? Why doesn't the New York Times or Washington Post or ABC, NBC, CBS, even Fox, go and have news stories about why these guys are picking the targets that they did? I mean, I look at the fact that you know, also the Louisville bank attack was in a place where guns were banned. You know, these murderers may be crazy in some sense, but they're not stupid. Their goal is to go and get media coverage. And they know the more people they kill, the more media coverage that they're going to get. And so they go to places where they know their victims can't defend themselves. The Buffalo mass murderer for last year has a long discussion in his manifesto about why he picked the target that he did. And hit right up there at the top is the fact he wanted to go to a place where people wouldn't have permanent concealed handguns because he worried, he worried explicitly that it would make it more difficult for him to go and kill lots of people. So rather than having schools that have signs in front of them that say this school is a gun-free zone, why not have schools where signs say warning? select teachers and staff here are carrying concealed handguns and will use them to go and uh, protect uh, students and others who are there. Now that, that there's so much to talk about here. I mean, uh, I, I think the Aurora Colorado killer actually had a choice between two theaters as well and chose- seven the theaters. He, take, he cased multiple theaters. He didn't go to the theater that was closest to his home. He didn't go to the one that advertised itself prominently as having the largest auditoriums in the uh, state of Colorado. There were seven movie theaters within a 20 minute drive of his home that were showing the premiere of the Batman movie uh, that he was aiming for there. He went, he went to the only one that posted signs banning permitted concealed handguns uh, that were there. And, you know, and I can give you case after case like that that's similar. Uh, you look at things like the uh, uh, Omaha, Nebraska mall shooting. Uh, there were seven malls that were there, enclosed malls. Only one of them posted signs banning permanent concealed handguns. It was actually the farthest one from his home, and that's the one he went to. You look at the Salt Lake City mall shooting. Uh, there were, again, seven in enclosed malls there. Two of them posted signs. He went to one of those. Or the one in Portland, Oregon. Uh, the mall shooting there, or uh, the Lafayette movie theater shooting in Lafayette, Louisiana. You know, again, you know, multiple movie theaters. He goes to the only one that posts signs banning permanent concealed handguns. You know, I don't have statements uh, in those cases about why these guys did. I have statements in other cases, but at some point you just put all these things together. And it's just, you know, I don't know how they can ignore the explicit statements by these killers. You you would think it was newsworthy. But, and there's so many things that the media gets wrong, I, I have to believe deliberately at some point. You know, you read the New York Times, uh, the Buffalo mass murder uh, in the series of six uh, editorials was like exhibit A for supposedly right-wing mass murders that was occurring. And they would go through very selectively parts of his manifesto. So they're missing this other part. But the other, I just mentioned this as an aside, uh, the guy was a racist. And so the media, if you're a racist, the media automatically classifies you as a conservative or a right winger. Uh, this, guy, this guy though was a racist because he was an environmentalist. He was upset about people having kids. He thought we had overpopulation. And he was particularly upset with minorities because he thought they in particular had, tended to have more children. So I don't, I don't know how many right-wingers you know that are upset about people having children or right-wingers that you know that call themselves socialist or eco-terrorists. Uh, I don't, I, 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 I guess I'm in a very weird group of right-wingers that I know that don't seem to use any of those terms. Well, there's, there certainly seems to be a narrative in the media and anything that goes against the narrative is going to be suppressed. Now we know that the person who committed these heinous murders on March 27th 
uh, in the Covenant School, Covenant School was a probably a trans activist, and their manifesto probably had something to do with trans activism, and they probably feel in the media that that would redound against their narrative, their pro-trans political narrative that they're they're trying to push out there into the world, and so they're concealing it from the rest of us, which I think is also a terrible thing. One of the things that you know is coming out so much, especially with David Hogg. I don't know if you follow that guy on social media. He's parlayed so, uh, his, yeah, he's parlayed his Parkview uh, survivalist into a, a Harvard education and into political activism extraordinaire. And he is one of the demagogues online pushing for assault bans, assault weapon bans, uh, which I think itself is a misnomer that they shouldn't be called assault weapons, but they are. But they are also not. Uh, they're not the the weapon of choice uh in these in the majority of these mass shootings oh, yeah. are they you su you suggested this in with respect to this last one but can you give us some stats with respect to uh, what weapons are used most yeah people go to our website at crimeresearch.org we put up a post last week that looked at all the mass public shootings from the, over 25 years from the beginning of 1998 up through now and what you find is about uh 15% of mass public shootings involve any type of rifle, let alone an assault weapon that's there. Uh, and you have about 56% uh, of, uh, of mass public shootings involve any type of handgun, only a handgun. So, and then you have other combinations. There's a few percent that use only a shotgun. And then you have other attacks that involve combinations of different types of guns. But you know, you look at murders generally, about 2% of murders involve any type of rifle. Uh, obviously, it's higher for these, but it's still a tiny fraction of, uh, of these attacks involve any type of rifle, let alone an assault weapon. Uh, and, you know, the bizarre thing, as you suggest in terms of your questioning, the whole definition of assault weapon, um, you know, you take something like the AR-15, which Biden has gone after, in particular, a lot of Democrats have. It is, a, it is functionally identical to any semi-automatic, small caliber hunting rifle, firing the same bullets with the same rapidity, doing the exact same damage. One term that's often used when talking about assault weapons is military style. And the key word is style there. They're just focusing on what the outside of the gun looks like. It looks like a military weapon. But even last year, the Associated Press style guide, very influential in the media, came out and said that this is a purely political term. It's meaningless. That there no, The Associated Press acknowledged that there's no militaries in the world that use the AR-15 uh, that's there. And, uh, you know, uh, but yet you still see people talking about these as being weapons of war or military weapons or what have you. And, uh, you know, the media, even though this is in the AP style guide now, uh, which is hardly a right wing type outlet, uh, you know, the press never calls them on it. There's so many things that I wish the, the press would kind of do, I think, just in terms of fairness, just asking them those types of questions, asking him, okay, you're proposing these laws. Would it have mattered in this last mass public shooting or not? And they, I, I know over the last maybe 15 years, I can point to maybe two times where anybody in the press has asked those types of questions. And, and the response has been, well, it's true. It hasn't stopped this attack. And it's true. It hasn't stopped any of these other attacks, but there's a possibility it might stop something in the future. And so it's worthwhile going and having it. But you know, you have Biden a few weeks ago go out to Monterey, California, where there was a mass public shooting involving a handgun. Of course, his big thing was calling for an assault weapons ban there, even though a handgun was used. And the other bizarre thing is he calls for an assault weapons ban. He calls for uh, red flag laws. He calls for background checks on private transfers of guns. And guess what? California already has all those laws. And yet California, he's going to California to talk about a mass public shooting that's there. And California has a much higher rate per capita of mass public shootings than uh, the average for the rest of the country. And yet there's no irony. Nobody from the press goes and says, well, why, do we, why are you going to California where we've had this attack? 
And they already have all these laws that you want to have for the rest of the nation. You know, what drives me really, really crazy is that is the people who throw in your face. Well, look at how these gun laws work for England. Look at how these gun laws work for Japan. Look at how these gun laws work for Australia. Can you straighten out some some, I think, bad epistemology on the part of people that that quote these these quote these studies or or at least presume that gun laws are responsible for the lack of gun violence in those cultures? Yeah, sure. I mean, look. Uh, the UK has a lower uh, homicide rate, firearm homicide rate than we have in the United States, but they had an even lower rate relative to the United States before they had these different types of gun control laws. There's three big gun control laws that have occurred in the UK, uh, 1920, 1956, and 1997. The first gun control laws in 1920 uh, had nothing to do with crime. Uh, you just had the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Uh, you had World War I had ended. You had a lot of unemployed soldiers around there. And the government was concerned that, you know, maybe they could have a Bolshevik Revolution in the UK. And so they passed rules that required licensing and made it fairly costly for relatively lower income individuals to be able to go and, and own a gun. The thing is, uh, there's an excellent book by a historian named Joyce Lee Malcolm from Harvard University Press called Guns and Violence, where she looks at the history of violent crime, in particular murders, uh, in the UK over the last thousand years or so. And one of the things that she points out is that they had an unbelievably low murder rate with guns in uh, the UK uh, prior to 1920. In 1900, in London, a city of eight and a half million people, they had two gun murders. I mean, th was it, I th no, it was three gun murders that they had there. And it's just, you know, I, I can't even get my head around a number like that. They had like no regulations on guns. Guns were very commonly owned. If you wanna do something fun, go look at old copies of the London Sunday Times from that period of time. And they had every type of gun being advertised. They had like, walking stick guns and briefcase guns, you know, so you have a, a gun essentially embedded in a briefcase and if you pressed a button on it, it would fire. Or you have book guns or other things. So people oh. could walk around with their walking stick and if somebody attacked them, they could shoot them. But yet with all these guns being advertised and all over the place, they had like no murders involving guns. And uh, they had a low violent crime rate overall at that time. But what you find is that uh, these different gun control laws weren't associated with drops in, in murder rates. Uh, in fact, after the 1997 handgun ban, uh, what you find is that uh, over the next eight years, uh, the homicide rate in the UK went up by about 50%. It, hmm. it went back down after that, but that was only after a huge increase in the number of police officers in the UK. Over a two-year period, they had a 14% increase. Over a four-year period, they had an 18% increase in the number of police officers in the UK. And it was only right, and that's because people were upset about the huge increase in, in, uh, in homicides that were occurring. And it was only, and violent crime, and it was only after that that you saw a drop. And you, you know, you go out like 16, 17 years after the original ban, and only at that point were they able to get the homicide rate back down to about what it was uh, with all this big increase in police to what it was before, before the ban. Uh, one other thing I'll just mention with regard to the UK is that um, they actually have a, a, a violent crime rate overall that's about twice the rate of violent crime in the United States. Um, most of Europe has much higher violent crime rates than we have in the United States. And they have other types of crimes that are, so like burglary rate. The burglary rate in the UK is about twice the burglary rate in the United States. But one thing that's particularly- And, and that's hot, oh, I'm sorry, I was gonna steal your thunder. That's hot burglaries, right? That's like uh, when- well, Yeah, well, not all of them, but the disproportionately. So they have an overall burglary rate that's twice the burglary rate in the United States, but 59% of the burglaries are what you were just referring to, hot burglaries. Those are burglaries that occur while the residents in the home. In the United States, it's about 13%. Why the difference? 
Well, it's actually pretty simple. What happens is um, we have surveys of these burglars and American burglars spend about twice as long casing a home before they break in compared to the British counterparts. And when asked why they spend the amount of time is they're worried about getting shot. And one way to prevent yourself from getting shot is to make sure nobody's home when you go and break in. So they spend extra time making sure nobody's there. Uh, but here, let me just summarize with one thing. And that is there are a number of places around the world, including in the United States that have either banned all guns or all handguns. In the United States, we've had Washington DC and Chicago, for example, which have banned all handguns for a period of time. And the thing is every single place in the world that's banned either all guns or all handguns has seen murder rates go up. You would think out of randomness, you'd get once or twice it would go down. You would think if guns on net are really bad, then you would think murder rates would go down for sure. And yet every single time it's gone up, often by very large amounts. Now, in the case of Washington, D.C. and Chicago, gun control advocates will say, well, it really wasn't a fair test. Because unless you go and ban guns every place in the country, people could still go and get guns from Maryland or Virginia or from the rest of Illinois or from Indiana. That really doesn't explain why it went up. It may explain why it didn't go down as much as they were predicting, because people could have presumably bought guns from those places beforehand uh, that was there. And, uh, you know, and also if they really thought it was an unfair test, it would have been nice if they had kind of told us before those laws had gotten passed that it wasn't going to work out as they were promising. But uh, the other thing is you can look around the world, whole countries that have banned guns, even island nations like uh, the Republic of Ireland or uh, the UK or uh, Jamaica, for example. And again, you know, you'd have no neighbor to go and blame necessarily in those cases. And yet every single time where you've had these types of gun bans, murder rates have gone up. And there's a simple reason for that. And this applies to gun control laws generally, not just bans. But it, you have to be careful that when you pass a law, you're not primarily going to be taking guns away from law-abiding good citizens. You may take some guns away from criminals, but if you're primarily disarming law-abiding good citizens, you're going to make it easier for criminals to go and commit crimes. And so that's what you see. And you see this in other places like uh, Mexico and other, you know, and I, I could go on and, and talk about it, but it's, it's very difficult. So one of the major sources of illegal guns in the United States are, are drug gangs. And, uh, you know, I, I know you're not gonna argue with this, but you know, how successful have we been in terms of stopping drug gangs from getting illegal drugs to sell? I don't think most people would argue we've been particularly successful in doing that. And the, the question is, why do you believe that you're gonna be any more successful in stopping drug gangs from getting guns, which they need to protect that very valuable property? It's not like a drug gang can go to the police and say, this other gang stole our drugs, can you help us get them back? They have to set up their own little military. So if I could click my fingers and cause all guns in the United States to disappear and all illegal drugs, how long do you think it'd be before illegal drugs started coming back in the US? If you're in El Paso, 20 minutes? How long do you think it would be before they bring in the weapons in order to protect that extremely valuable property that they have? They'd be bringing them in at the same time. Yeah, and, and, I, and I know that Australia had historically low uh, gun violence and also experienced this thing, this, this uh, spike in violent crime, spike in murders after they, after they did their their gun buyback thing, and I think it was in the '90s. But now I think they have; they still brag about those laws, even though they have more guns now than they did at the time of the buyback. Am I am I misstating? Uh, uh, almost completely correct. The the homicide rate uh, basically didn't go up, but it didn't fall. But what if? But but you're completely right about the change in gun ownership. There was an immediate. 25% drop in gun ownership from the buyback that they had in 1996 and 97. But then people were allowed to go and buy guns again. And uh, by about 2010, uh, the gun ownership rate in Australia was actually above what it had been prior to the buyback that they had had. And so 
if the gun control advocates are right, what you should have seen is an immediate sharp drop in you know, gun crimes that were occurring. And then over time, a gradual increase in those crimes. And that's not what you observe at all. Uh, you know, what often happens when you read the news is uh, people will say, well, um, you know, uh, firearm homicides fell by 50% or something like that over uh, after the buyback occurred. Here's the problem. Well, if you look over the 15 years prior to the buyback, firearm homicides were falling, okay? And they continued to fall, but at a much slower rate afterwards. It was pretty flat afterwards. But, it, but if I am going to have a line that's going perfectly straight down the whole time, I could pick any point along that line and the after average is gonna be below the before average. But mm -hmm. if it was a perfectly straight line, I would say it doesn't look like it had any impact, even though the after average is below the before average that's there. And so what you want to do is say, OK, was there a discontinuity? Did it fall at a faster rate or slower rate after the change in the law? Was it some discontinuity in the line that's there? And if anything, you see it was falling much faster prior to the buyback than it was afterwards. Um, and, you know, it's really a, a really elemental, stupid mistake in terms of uh, how you look at data that's there that gets them to go and make the claim that it was somehow beneficial. But, you know, Japan, you mentioned also, uh, is often something that people want to put it. You essentially have had a, a, a gun ban for literally hundreds of years in uh, Japan. Uh, what you want to look at is what happens before and after these bans are in effect. Uh, you know, so as we were pointing out with the UK before, you have a situation where it's mind boggling how few gun crimes that they had before they had any laws. So how can you attribute the low rate to something that existed prior to any laws that were in effect? Indeed, I, I think we could go through the myths uh, that the the gun control myths that the media throws out there for hours. I, I just recommend that people get your book, uh, Gun Control Myths, and read that. It is very, very educational because I think uh, we're fed a narrative that clearly isn't true. I just have a couple of super chats here to uh, to get to real fast, John, and then I know you have to be on your way. Jonathan Honig for two ninety nine. Thank you, Jonathan, for. Uh, watching the show. It's always uh, great to see you on there. Catherine for $1.99. Thanks for this discussion, of course. Bonnie Bertrand for 99 cents. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Gail Parker for $1.99. Ashley Shrugged for $1.99. We have 3D printing technology. Can't stop that. Now, there's another thing. You Can can you right. 3D print these uh, weapons now, some of them? Well, you have 3D metal printers that can print a gun that is looks identical to any gun that you can go and buy in the store uh, and it will function exactly the same way. Uh, so, you know, people often talk about it in terms of plastic guns or whatever, but I mean, uh, you know, the real issue is just metal printing out there and they, look, there's so many things that are related to this. So people talk about banning things like magazines above, you know, 10 bullets capacity or something like that. It just cracks me up. I've seen, a, a, a magazine is a box with a spring in it. I've seen people with a simple metal press produce a magazine in like two minutes. So, you know, you can go and ban these things, but the notion that you're gonna be able to stop criminals from being able to go get something that's so, with such simple machine tools, you can go and produce on your own. I mean, essentially you stamp it out, you fold it, you put the uh, spring in the bottom that's there, and you put a plate on top of the, the, the spring. And you got yourself a magazine. And, uh, you know, I don't I don't know if most people just don't have any clue about how guns work or have ever been around them. That's my guess is what often happens. Uh, that's been my experience when I talk to actors that have a knee jerk emotional reaction to the idea of a gun. And they they won't really budge off of that to hear the facts. I feel like what we're also dealing with here is that Frederick Bastiat thing that seen versus the unseen and, right, and yeah, yeah, yeah. 
right? You so you you we see the assault weapon ban. It's it, it's sexy. It's it's it makes headlines. It's bromidal. It's easy for people to grasp. It's the, and and the magazine bans. What you don't see though is how that's taking guns out of the hands of people who actually could use them to save their lives. What you don't see is that the, 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 the smaller you make those magazines, the less an opportunity somebody has in times of extreme stress to actually defend themselves. You want a weapon with a, a greater magazine capacity because when you're under stress, you're only functioning at 12% of your capacity. You are very unlikely to hit the target you're trying to hit when they're coming at you with a firearm or a knife themselves. So you yeah. want from at least from every gun instructor I've ever dealt with, you want a high capacity magazine, even in your pistol. Right. Well, look, um, you know, one of the things that Biden has come out against many times is just the notion of any type of semi-automatic gun. And uh, uh, so it takes what's the alternative to a semi-automatic rifle? It's one that you manually load. You have to physically yourself put another bullet in the chamber after you fire around. Well, if you have to fire multiple shots, either because you're facing multiple attackers or you fire and miss or you fire and wound but don't incapacitate the attacker, you may not have the luxury of time to go and manually reload your gun. Semi-automatic gun is one pull the trigger, one bullet comes out, it reloads itself, one pull the trigger, one bullet comes out. I have to say, uh, two seasons ago, uh, we did kind of a deep dive on TV cop shows on ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. And the thing is, 85% of the guns used by criminals during that season were machine guns. Okay. And so, and, uh, and, uh, you know, the problem is, is that uh, if you look in the United States, there's been since the 1930s, there's been one murder in the United States involving a machine gun. But you could go and watch. Uh, an episode of Magnum PI, and you think there are more people killed with machine guns in one s episode in one day on Magnum PI than have been killed in the entire United States since the 1930s. And, uh, and you see that in one cop show after another. And then they refer to them as like AR 15s or something like that to make people think, you know, AR 15s are machine guns. And I know, I know, um, uh, the gun control people brag about working with producers and writers on these different TV shows in order to kind of get these narratives out there to convince people. And so this last, this current season, one of the big things that's been going on, and I know it's not by accident, is by showing people with permitted concealed handguns where something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because of the I believe because of the Bruin decision uh, last uh, June that struck down uh, the concealed handgun laws in New York and California and five other states where you had to go and provide a good reason to some public official for why you should be able to go and carry. And so uh, we collect these stories on our website at crimeresearch.org uh, where you know they'll have an episode where they'll show the concealed carry permit holder doesn't shoot the criminal, but accidentally shoots a bystander. Or they'll show uh, the concealed permit holder gets in the way of the police and allows the criminal to go and escape. Or they'll show an episode where uh, the concealed carry permit holder has his gun taken away from him by the criminal or something like that. Uh, we looked at uh, so-called active shooting cases. Uh, the FBI collects these. I can go through the problems with their thing. But if you look over the eight years from uh, uh, 2014 to 2021, uh, there were 360 of these active shooting cases, a gun fired in public, not involving some other type of crime, where the point was simply to go and harm other people. Uh, anything from one person being targeted and missed all the way up to a mass public shooting. And what you find is that 124 of those were instances where somebody with a permanent concealed handgun stopped the attack. So that's about 34%. If you look at only cases where uh, the person was legally allowed to carry, so get rid of gun free zones, you're talking about over 50% of the attacks where people were illegally allowed to carry were stopped. But the, but the thing with regard to the TV shows is that there's not one case, there's not one case where a person accidentally shot a bystander. There's not one case 
where the permit holder got in the way of the police officers. There's not one case where the person had his gun taken away by the criminal. Are these possibilities? Yeah. But if you go and you watch uh, these entertainment uh, police shows, you think that's the only thing that happens when somebody uses a gun defensively. And, and you see a similar bias when you're looking at the major news outlets. Uh, we did a deep dive on media coverage on defensive gun uses during 2021. Uh, if you look at uh, USA Today, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal, between those five newspapers and uh, CNN and MSNBC, which had zero defensive gun use stories, they had 10 defensive gun use stories. Most of those were ones where something went wrong. You know, the person wasn't able to successfully use the gun to stop the attack mainly. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, at the same time, they had over 2,700 news stories about gun crimes. So you could be somebody who you think I'm really well read. I read all the major newspapers and I read and I listen to CNN and MSNBC religiously. Uh, and who can blame them? Coming away with the perception that if I only get rid of the guns, we'll be better off because there's like no beneficial uses of guns that they're going to see. Lots and lots of gun crimes. So why not get rid of the guns that are there? Whereas in reality, uh, the estimates that we have indicate that people use guns defensively about five times more frequently each year to stop crime uh, than they use them to commit crime. But you would never know that from reading the news. You know, a lot of it I can understand without resorting to bias. Uh, if you or I were editors of a news bureau and we had two stories come across our desk, in one case, there's a dead body on the ground. Uh, in another case, let's say a woman's brandished a gun no shots are fired, criminal runs away, uh, you're not even sure what crime would have been committed, which story would you be more likely to run with? I think I know what I would do. I'd be more likely to run with the dead body story. But just because something's newsworthy, you know, I can understand that. But for policy, we care about both cases where somebody killed the attacker and the much, much more frequent cases where people simply brandished a gun to stop an attack. Um, yes, uh, we are killing gun myths left and right here. I can say that I brandished a gun to stop a robbery and it was never put in any newspaper anywhere. Um, and uh, how many of those uh, go unreported? Now, we just know of the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands per year. I mean, wasn't there a, Flor a Florida State University study that put it as high as 2.5 million times a year? Yeah, there are a lot of surveys out there uh, that look at it. The most recent large survey that I've seen put it at about 1.7 million, but probably the average of these surveys is about 2 million times a year uh, that that occurs. Uh, you know, it's, uh, let me put it this way. 22%, only 22% of violent crimes are reported to police, okay? And only a tiny fraction of those get news coverage, okay? So, you know, it's not to, and the thing is, uh, if somebody uses a gun defensively uh, and the criminal runs away, there's at least a decent chance the person's even less likely to go and report that type of crime, you know, that didn't occur than uh, one that did occur. And so, uh, you know, there's lots of reasons to believe that these things aren't reported to police and they're only gonna be a small fraction of those that are gonna be covered by the media even when they wanna cover it. I think something objectivists can appreciate is context is truth and without context, you can't have truth folks. And I think John, you've given us a great context from which uh, all of us who are watching today can, can make real choices with respect to this very pressing issue because the forces of uh, the, the hard anti-gun forces out there have command of the media, they have command of social media, and they are trying to win. And the only way they can't win is if we come at them with the truth. Um, I'm just going to make an announcement real quick here, John, before I, I bid you adieu. Tonight at 10 p.m. UK time, Cutting Edge, titled Music and the Subconscious with special guest uh, Dr. David Barry, a professor of musicology and composition. John, it's been such a pleasure talking to you and seeing you face to face. It's been a while. 
I'm, uh, I, I so appreciate that you did this at the last minute for me. I think you busted a thousand myths in people's minds uh, just by you giving us the straight facts uh, that we all so desperately need to hear. Well, I appreciate you being there, Mark. You, you make a big difference. Thank you very much. As do you. And, and folks, uh, join us again on The Daily Objective. Uh, and until that time, always remember to check your premises. Peace.